Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special 5 by 15 event with Marcus de Sotoy and Alex Bellos. For as long as there have been people, there have been games. And for nearly as long, we've been exploring and discovering mathematics. Marcus de Sotoy's new book, Around the World in 80 Games, is a celebration of our human passion for both. From backgammon to chess, from video games to card games, the book explores the maths behind the games we love and why we love them. It's on sale this evening from our independent bookshop partner, Newham Books, and the information about how to order will be posted shortly in the chat. Marcus de Sotoy is an award-winning mathematician and the Simone New Chair for the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University. He has been named by The Independent on Sunday as one of the UK's leading scientists, and he's written extensively for The Guardian, The Times and The Daily Telegraph, and appears regularly on BBC Radio 4. We're so pleased that Marcus will be in conversation this evening with Alex Bellos, a grandmaster of the puzzling world and brilliant on all things cryptic, whose best-selling award-winning books, which include Alex's adventures in Numberland, have been translated into more than 20 languages. Marcus and Alex will be in conversation this evening for around an hour, and there will be time towards the end for your questions. So please do post these in the Zoom Q&A box at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. Without any further ado, Marcus, Alex, welcome. Over to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. And hello, Marcus. Great to see you here. <laughs> Great to see you, Alex. Um, I hope your um, throat is going to last the hour. I think, I think yes, yes. I must apologise. I went to the Arsenal Man City match uh, again yesterday. Okay. Um, and uh, I do think that my screaming did help us to... Beat Man City 1-0, so it was probably worth the uh, sacrifice of my voice, <laughs> but apologies for <laughs> its state this evening. Okay, so I'm going to um, ask a whole bunch of questions, and then let's see how the um, the dialogue goes. So it's really about your brilliant um, new book, and the book's about games, and I wanted to just sort of start at the beginning. You know, what is it about games that you like so much and always have liked, and what is it about them that then led you to writing this book? Yeah, I think uh, one of the important things about games, first of all, they're rules. And being a mathematician, I quite like rules and exploring the implications of those rules. So in a funny way, I sort of feel like a game is like a little piece of mathematics that, um, uh, you know, the rules are like the axioms. And then each time you play, you're sort of exploring, oh, what are the theorems you can make out of this? So I think partly that's uh, one of the reasons. But also, I think another important quality about games are that they're separate from our real lives. They have a separate place, um, a separate time very often. I think that's quite important that they should be separate from our lives, um, uh, somehow an escapism. I think they actually share a lot in common with stories um, that, you know, I'm sure games probably emerged as we sat around the campfire and sometimes we told stories to each other and sometimes we came up with games to play. But I think there's a quality about a game which is slightly different from a story because a story you're kind of a passive uh, listener. Um, but a game, you're all active participants. So I quite like that about a game. And, um, you know, a story can make you sad, but a game can actually make you guilty about the actions that you've made in that game. So I think, and again, I think that has a quality which is quite similar to mathematics, because the mathematics I enjoy is a mathematics that is very often disconnected from the world around us. I mean, certainly mathematics helps us to explain the universe, but uh, I think for me, I've always loved mathematics in a sense, which is a world in its own. Um, and so I, I kept on finding these resonances with uh, the, my love of games and my love of doing mathematics. So, um, but I think, you know, this book actually grew out of um, my travels around the world. So when I uh, visit a country for my mathematical research, um, I often like to seek out the games that that particular culture plays, because I, I really feel like games are a fantastic little window into the way that people think, uh, you know, it, tell me the game you play, I'll tell you who you are, uh, that they they sort of give a, an inkling into um, the culture, the heritage, the place that I'm visiting. So so for years uh, on my travels, I've been sort of collecting weird and wonderful games, um, 
on, on those travels. And I, I just somehow felt, oh, you know, I've got these lovely collection. I, I, I want to share them with readers. And so that's what kind of led to, to this book. And But a weird thing happened. I mean, I, I put all the cards um, on these kind of uh, uh, like fighting cards. You probably do the same with your books, sort of <laughs> write down lots of interesting ideas. And, um, and, and a weird thing happened when I laid them out to try and work out a narrative journey through these games and game themes, I had exactly 80 cards. And I thought, oh my gosh, Message. that is just a miracle, <laughs> you know? So, cause I had flirted with all oh, around the world in 67 games or something, but when there were 80, I thought, oh gosh, I have to, to use Phileas Fogg's journey as a kind of, uh, as a, a kind of, to help the journey of the book. And, um, and I actually went back and read that book um, around the, I mean, I probably read it when I was a kid um, and I didn't realize that games are a really important part of that book. I mean, Phileas Fogg just loves playing games and he actually spends more time on his journey playing games with his fellow travelers rather than looking out the window, you know, as they come into Mumbai, the beautiful view of this new uh, country, he's busy uh, winning, you know, a grand slam at whist, 13 tricks. And, you know, that's that's what gives him the buzz, not, not looking out the window. He just wants to get back to the reform club as quickly as possible. So so actually that story is a nice framing device, actually, for, for my yeah. own journey around the world. Isn't that book also kind of game on the reader because about the day that he's going to get back and actually he gets back, you think he's a day late, but he's a day early because of the kind of the trick of the international date line or something like that so absolutely and in, yeah. in a way he actually does it in 81 days that's right um, uh and i actually use this as a trick because i thought um i thought i would actually add an extra game so there are 80 games but then the 81st game is the book itself so you can actually uh read the book from game one to game 80 or you can throw a, a dice uh, and let the dice decide. So, you know, throw the dice. So it will come, let's see which uh, you're going to read. Ah, game four to start with. And then you will throw the dice again. Um, and it's one. So you go to game five and you, you have to go around the whole book. And there's a little table at the back to uh, make sure you don't read a game twice. And Did you suggest to um, Fourth Estate, it's Fourth Estate, isn't it? Before yeah, that's right. Um, that they um, maybe sell it. With a with a with a dice included, like on the front, sort of sellotape. Mm, very nice, yeah, exactly. Really but, um, <laughs> well, I and I also calculate. I thought, you know, being a mathematical nerd, I would calculate how many different books can you generate um, in this way. And it was actually quite an interesting challenge. So, if there are any mathematicians out there, uh, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's not eighty factorial, because you can't get to like the seventy ninth game with a roll of the dice. So you've got this restriction of you can only go sort of like uh, six at a time. So um, it's quite a, a fun little puzzle. And um, uh, But there are enough books actually to keep everyone going with a unique book. So um, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think one thing which um, I think games have and that maths has that often people who don't do maths don't realise is this sense of playfulness. And playfulness, I think, is is so important to kind of human nature. And it's one of the reasons why we like, um, obviously playing games to be playful. And also, I don't know, I mean, I certainly, I've, I've never studied maths beyond degree level, but I always found it quite playful. I don't know if you want to explore this idea that you find maths playful and this was a way of kind of helping express some of those ideas. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think mathematics starts with us trying to understand the world around us. And so, um, whether it's building pyramids or um, working out areas of land. Um, uh, but then there, it starts to take on a quality of its own, which is, oh, what if I change this? What if I do that? And, and I think uh, playing is absolutely right. That's what I do as a mathematician is um, play with ideas. Uh, my imagination, my creativity is a, an incredibly important part of how I do my mathematics. And and I think probably, you know, games probably started, um, why did we play games? You know, the, in fact, there's been a proposal that our species somehow evolved so dramatically because of our game playing ability. And so there's a suggestion we should be called Homo ludens, not Homo sapiens. And I think probably that original urge was, hey, this is a really nice safe space to experiment, to do 
kind of like experiments about what if, you know, what if things work out like this? What are the implications of that? But I think very quickly, um, games start to disconnect from being useful. And actually, I think if you're trying to look for utility in a game, it's no longer a game. It starts to become work. Um, so I think inherently, games should be useless. Um, you shouldn't be looking for, oh yeah, they're helping us in our evolutionary survival. And um, and for me, the best mathematics is one that you're just, um, you know, you're exploring just for the fun of it, for the sake of it. Um, now, very often the fun thing is with maths is that it will land back down again and help us explain the universe around us. So if it starts its journey with the universe, but then we play around and very often the weird things we come up with mathematically and then turn out to be the things which are very yeah. useful. You know, Einstein relied on four-dimensional geometry that was developed in the middle of the 19th century, but that was just purely for the, hey, what if we had more dimensions? What what happens to these geometries? Um, yeah. It wasn't for utility. It was for the joy of mathematics in its own right. And I think yeah. we kind of miss that in our education system that uh, we often – we often just think about the utility and we will lose the playfulness and we will lose the fantastic mathematics, which will uh, lead to the next innovations if we, if we, if we forget that playfulness. It's true. I mean, there are so many examples in history where an idea that was invented just for the pure fun of it, 10, 100, 1,000 years later has been kind of crucial to some really amazing application. Um, this book if you didn't read the um, subtitle, Around the World Made to Games, you might think, oh, is a historian written this? But it's a mathematician unlocks the secrets. In what way is your book different to say one that might have been written by a historian or a sociologist? Like, what, what is the element that you're trying to bring out that's new? Yeah, um, I, I suppose my thesis is that games are a way of playing mathematics that underlying every game really is a little hidden piece of mathematics. And sometimes you're building the game using a piece of mathematics. I mean, there's a wonderful game I uh, play with my kids. Uh, where is it? Um, I did have it, uh, which is Dobble. Uh, I don't know yeah. whether uh, uh, I had- I probably it. got one somewhere. Yeah. Oh, uh, here it is. Here it is. Like it. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, th this is a, a fantastic little game because it's just like, um, the idea is, you know, every two cards, um, they have two symbol, uh, one symbol in common on both. I mean, can you spot yeah. that one? Is it, uh, gosh, yeah. can I get it before you? That um, one, because of the colour, it pops out actually because of the colour. Oh, yeah? Oh, see, I see, I can't see it yet. The red what button. is it? It's the red button or the red sort of... Oh, my gosh, it is. It's the red no entry sign. Yeah, no, um, sign. You see, I, but I was looking at green things. And uh, anyway, <laughs> th this is such a beautiful game. But but um, actually, hiding behind this is the most extraordinary piece of geometry called a projective plane of order seven. And so if you know some maths, you can make games. But also, if you know the maths underlying a game, it can often give you an edge. So in a way... Uh, the reason a mathematician is writing this book is that I'm giving you all my mathematical um, tricks for how I uh, play the games that are, that I do with my family. So, so I'm giving away all my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that leads perfectly on to let's play a game because we were yep. thinking about this. Let's try and play a game and let's you you we're gonna you're gonna play it. You're gonna explain it. Yeah, play it with the audience and reveal the mathematics behind it. Yeah, I thought, you know, um, uh, I think we're both believers that mathematics is not a spectator sport, that you've got to do it. So uh, I think this game will hopefully illustrate why if you think mathematically, it gives you an edge in a game. So I'm going to explain the rules. It's called, um, it's one of the games in the book, kind of a game that I made up. Um, it's called Chocolate Chili Roulette. So I've got all of these chocolates. Um, and I've also got a chili here. Um, you've got to go and get a chili from your kitchen if you're going to play this. Um, or uh, if you lose, you're going to be eating the chili. But how do you play the game? Um, well, basically, uh, you're going to be able to take one, two or three chocolate bars from this pile of chocolates. And we're going to take it in turns and we're going to use the chat for you to make your suggestions. And Alex is going to choose... Um, the 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 most popular choice of one, two, and three. Um, um, so I'm going to go first. I'm I'm not feeling very hungry tonight. So I am going to take 
just one chocolate bar from the pile now uh so now it's your turn are you going to take one oh, no, i have to make sure that you see how many yeah. there are so I, I'm um, at... or it may i may have some point. so there we are do you want to take so audience do you want to take one two or three chocolate bars um so okay. the answers are coming in remember you're coming. trying to leave me with the chili with no chocolate right now they're coming from so from the first part Two. Two is definitely two. the most common okay. so far. Two. So two. there you go. They, take they've two. taken two, the audience. Okay. Um, right. I'm going to take two as well. Um, so now okay. over to you, audience. How yeah. many chocolate bars do you want to take? Uh, remember, you're trying to leave me to eat the chili. What are they going for? Three. Now they're saying three. Now they're saying three. Three. Oh, they're, they're a hungry lot. Team three. Okay. Three there. <laughs> okay. I'm going to take one. And now, audience, okay. you can take one, two, or three chocolate bars. And remember, you don't want Marcus to finish it. Yeah, uh, probably you you're all realizing you're stuffed. But um, what are they? What's the option? Okay, number one is actually the most common now. Yeah, they're probably hoping I'm going to make a mistake. You know, if I took one, then you'd be. Able, but I'm going to take all three. I'm afraid, guys, you've got to go to your kitchen and eat a chili. Um, okay, and now that was a little unfair because I went first, and actually there are quite a few games. That if you go first, you can guarantee a win. So, for example, uh, Connect Four. Connect Four is a game that we now have analyzed, and there's an algorithm that if you go first, you go down in the middle um, and you go first. Um, great. So, okay, I'm going to let the audience go first. Yeah, so, audience, how many do you want to take? Can be one, two, or three. Yeah, one, two, Let's or three. See. And um, I'll tell you, there are 13 chocolate bars just to yeah, help. 13 chocolate bars. Yeah. Um, so, what are they going for? They're thinking. I can. They're thinking. Yeah, yeah um, they're thinking. Yeah. Nothing has come through quite yet. Nothing's come through. That's interesting. Um, yes. so, yes. uh, no one's daring. Well, I'll give you a hint. If you, uh, what I did last time was to take one chocolate bar. That is kind. There, there, there you are. There's coming. Somebody's right. saying thirteen. Somebody. Okay, that's yeah. very good. No, but you're right. Do you one. Know. Do one because that's. Okay, good. we'll do one. Okay, there we go. If you started with one. Yeah, I'm going to take one. Any, and you're going to take so, one. So now, okay. yeah, so uh, now you're left with 11 chocolate bars. How many do you want to take? Audience. Well, another then, one. Oh, I can see a People three. Saying one. Let's take three. 11 is too much. Yeah, okay, okay, three. And now I'm going to take one again. How many do you want to take, audience? Yep, oh, they're going three. I can see that. They're a clever audience, this <laughs> one. I'm going to take one. Oh, and then they take three again, and I have to eat the chili. <laughs> Well, if I eat the chili, I really will lose my voice. So, um, uh, um, but I think, yeah, uh, Fiona, I think it was, who was on fire there, um, uh, which is that actually, if you're left with four, you realize, okay, I, whatever, uh, whatever I take, you take the rest. So you want, it's, it's about grouping things in groups of four. So um, whatever you, so actually there are 13 chocolate bars and you take one to start with, and then you've just got three lets of four. And so whatever somebody does, if they take one, you take three. Uh, then you've got another group of four. If they take two, you take two. And then the last group of four, you take three, I take one, and you win. So this game, very simple, but if you think, think mathematically, that's going to give you the edge. So the idea is that many of the games that we play, whether it's Monopoly, Ticket to Ride, Catan, Backgammon, uh, if you can think about it mathematically, that's going to give you an edge and uh, and help you to win. So it, it does say, you know, unlocks the secrets of the greatest game. And in the, um, the flap, it says, where should you move first in Connect 4? I didn't know that. Now I know. It must always be in the Drop middle. Drop down the middle. <laughs> um, and that's the other secrets uh, yes. that's maybe less well known that might help us well um i do one of my games is monopoly and i think monopoly is a highly flawed game but it does seem to be many people's game of choice at christmas time so let me give you a little hint for that one what is the most visited square on the monopoly board it turns out it's jail because there are many ways to go to jail. You can visit jail or you can go to the uh, square opposite that sends you to jail. Um, if you throw a double, you get to go again. If you get, throw two doubles, you get another go. But if you throw three doubles, you get punished and you're sent to jail. So actually, 
you're three times more likely to land on the jail square than anywhere else. But, you know, you can't buy jail. So how is that going to be useful? Um, well, it's where do you go after jail? So um, look, I've got, uh, um, remember in Monopoly, you throw two dice. Um, what is the most common throw? There you are. Please, please. Uh, well, the most common throw of the dice is six, seven, or eight, because there are so many ways to make a seven. So one and six, two and five, three and four, four and three, five and two, six and one. So you're six times more likely to throw a seven than say a 12, which is double six, only one way to do that. So um, after you've gone to jail, most people are ending up in the orange regions of property. So that's the property you need to buy stack it with the hotels and as everyone comes out of jail um you cash in and and you win you win monopoly so um there's one of my little hints um for for no monopoly for example but um uh but actually i think monopoly is a very flawed game for for me a game uh it shouldn't finish before it ends and by that i mean you shouldn't know who's going to win halfway through the game because i think monopoly you very quickly realize um, who is going to win. And, and then you just spend ages grinding out the bankruptcy of all the other players. And, and so it can it's be quite not an cruel, interesting game. Can't it? it can be quite a cruel game, Monopoly. Yeah, yeah. Either. yeah. I talk in the book about um, the longest game of Monopoly ever played, which was some students in America um, who played for five days and it just kept on going round and round. And at one point, they the bank ran out of money and they phoned up uh, the makers of Monopoly and said, what, well, what do we do? Um, and they said, hold it. And the bank can't go bankrupt. And so they got a security van and they, they, uh, they got Monopoly money delivered to the students and they carried on playing. And eventually they just gave up and they said, look, this game is so painful. Um, we're just going to stop. They've already got in the Guinness book of records for their longest game ever. Um, but in the book, I also describe the shortest game ever um because you can actually finish the game in 21 seconds so i give a sequence of moves that um it uh, if you do it quickly you can do it in 21 seconds so um you basically one person is so lucky that they um uh, go around a couple of times on their first go the other player is so unlucky that they start losing money and and so you can bankrupt them basically in four turns <laughs> um so Look at all these 80 games, you must have a real sense of the kind of aesthetics of a game, the, the kind of how it feels, what it's like to play, sort of the mathematics. What to you makes a great game? So obviously not finishing before it's over. Are there yeah. any other kind of rules, Marcus's rules for what makes a good game? Yeah. I think many people will think that a mathematician will choose chess as a kind of the best game. And I see you've got a chess ball behind you. So yeah. are you, are you, uh, really you ready? Get my kids to learn it, but yeah. they're refusing. I mean, chess, chess is a great game. It's got a great history, starts in India. Um, but I think there's a sort of problem with chess, which is if you've got two players that are mismatched, you know, when you're starting to play with your kids, um, you know, you're going to be so much better than them. And I think that's, I want a game where when people come to the game, uh, there's a chance anybody could win, uh, even if somebody's never seen the game before and they start playing. So I think that actually you do want a little bit of chance in the game um, so that that kind of often evens things up. I mean, you know, Gary Kasparov against Donald Trump in chess is not going to be an interesting game, but Gary Kasparov against Trump at Snakes and Ladders, well, you know, anyone could win that one. And okay, so Snakes and Ladders, I think, just think has too much um, dependence mm. on the roll of a dice. And mm. basically, you know, I used to play this as a kid and I used to think with my sister that I was being incredibly clever as I sent her down a snake. But of course, you know, we were just kind of cogs in the machine rolling the dice. So there mm. really was nothing. So I think for me, a perfect game is a balance of strategy. So you can express yourself in the game. You want a bit of agency uh, to express who you are, um, but maybe a little bit of randomness as well in order to kind of even things up a little bit. So 
Um, I think backgammon, which is game number one in the book, for me, hits a lot of the sweet spots. Um, it's uh, very often the, the dynamics of the game changes very quickly from one moment to the other. Um, it's got that element of chance, but even if you have bad rolls of the dice, a bit of good strategy about moving the pieces can help you. Um, I also think a really important quality of a good game is it should have simple rules. My family switch off if I'm still reading the rules after two minutes. Um, um, so simple rules, but it should give rise to very many different versions of the game. So, you know, I think um, Noughts and Crosses is a bit too simple and very quickly you've seen all the versions, the games of Noughts and Crosses. So, um, so I think it's actually a little bit like good mathematics. Um, I'm actually uh, study symmetry and symmetry um, has rules called uh, uh, something called group theory and they are beautifully simple yet as we explored this mathematically they gave rise to extraordinary complexity of different symmetrical objects that we began to discover so i think like the best mathematics a good game simple rules by giving rise to to huge kind of variety in the in the stories that you tell with those rules um you do include computer games don't you Yes. In the book, I see that you're wearing a T-shirt, which is a high score. Is that Pac-Man? Yeah, Pac-Man, yeah. Is, is it your high score or is it? <laughs> no, no, I wish it was. Uh, no, <laughs> it, it isn't. No. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't include Pac-Man, but I did include Tetris, um, mm. which, you know, is has its origins in Russia. Um, some people might have seen uh, the documentary about um, the making of Tetris, um, uh, but it's, it's a great story. But but it, there's a very interesting mathematical uh, theorem about Tetris, um, which is, uh, you know, theoretically, if you were really good at this game, could you keep on clearing everything such you could make the game infinite? Um, you know, maybe you're just good enough that you... and. But there's actually a mathematical proof that um, if you let the game play on and on, um, uh, with certainty, uh, a probability of one, um, at some point you will start to see, it's a bit like the infinite monkey theorem where, um, you know, if you let a monkey just tap the typewriter, at some point you will see, um, you know, to be or not to be coming out of that. Um, the same thing applies to Tetris. So at some point you'll get a sequence of the Z pieces in such a way that um, with that sequence of Z pieces, there's absolutely no way um, to be able to clear uh, the screen if you have that sequence. So so mathematically we can prove that Tetris actually is, is a game that with probability one, um, nobody will be skillful enough to, to clear it uh, infinitely uh it, it, to infinity so <laughs> i think i would have lost <laughs> days if not years before we ever get to that point <laughs> um so one of the overriding themes of the book is that playing games is is, is is sort of part of the human condition that everyone everywhere does it but also part of the themes of the book is that as you go through the world it's, it's things are a bit different so can you talk a little bit about different things that you picked up from different parts of the world. And at the beginning you yeah. said, show me your game, I can tell you about you, who you are. Maybe some examples of games that reveal something about where they're from. Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the favorite continents uh, that I visit on the journey um, is the Indian subcontinent, uh, because uh, there are some amazing games which have their origins. I already mentioned that chess um, has its origins um in india oh well, another game that i found actually um uh, is snakes and ladders and this is a snakes and ladders board um that you can find uh it's from india but um it's actually in the pitts rivers museum in oxford uh, where i'm a professor um and it turns out that snakes and ladders was actually a game to teach about um the impact of good and bad karma on your desire to reach nirvana or moksha. Um, so actually you can probably, might be able to see this little elephant. So this is Ganesh, the elephant god on square number 68. Um, and uh, this is where you were aiming for. The, the, one of the squares was the final finishing line, which is reaching nirvana. Um, but if you behave well, you will go up a snake, uh, up a ladder. If you behave badly, you'll go down a snake. Um, so it's interesting that um, this was a, a game to 
to teach actually about good and bad karma. Actually, if you miss the square, you had to be reborn. So actually, uh, you know, the Indian philosophy, we believed that um, you were reborn. So you had to go round and round again until you got to this. Um, now, one of the interesting things is in India, I found that there was a real love of giving yourself up to the role of the dice that a dice were and and fate the idea that your fate was determined for you um the idea of your dharma that somehow you couldn't go against what your kind of spirit yeah, was before the invention of probability theory when we realized that you can mathematize it <laughs> well exactly but um so uh, i think that you know i i discovered that even chess chess originally was played with a dice and the dice would determine which of the pieces you were allowed to move next and when gambling was eventually uh um, bands in, in uh, India, um, they weren't allowed to use the dice. And then people said, well, um, hold on, actually, we could play this game without a dice. Um, and it became a pure strategy game. So so I think it's kind of interesting that um, uh, the idea of slightly fatalistic view of life leads to um, the idea that you enjoy giving yourself up to the role of a dice. Um, whilst I found that that contrasted actually with uh, when I found the games that I was exploring in China. And China, um, there's much more um, a love of strategy and actually long-term strategy. So, you know, whilst chess is quite an aggressive game where you're taking pieces off the board, um, it's, it's quite uh, uh, fast moving in a way because you see the pieces are gradually dwindling. Um, you know, I suppose the comparable game in the Far East would be something like Go, um, originating in China, loved by Korea and Japan. And this is much more a territory game. You're slowly building up um, uh, control of the land. And, and so I think that was also a different quality. I mean, you have to be very careful with um, these kind of stereotyping um, different games and things. Um, but I, I, it was interesting that even card games, you know, um, cards seems like they might have originated in India. And I, I found these amazing um, Ganjifa cards. Um, so uh, they're rather beautiful because they're circular. Um, but you also might see they're like a, a wonderful place for, I mean, these are a replica, but um, the kind of Indian miniatures that um, uh, people love to paint. Um, these cards would be a, a, a lovely um, place to sort of do Indian miniatures. But the game that's played with this is very similar to Whist, the one that Phileas Fogg loved. And so it'd be a capturing game again, you know, capturing other people's cards. Um, whilst I found these, um, uh, where, uh, so my my desk is so messy. Um, I had some uh, Chinese cards um, uh, that, uh, where, where, okay, well, the Chinese cards actually, uh, at first sight, I, I didn't really understand what they were playing, and I got somebody to um, play the game for me, and it was more like Rummy, where you're collecting cards. So again, this difference, rather than capturing cards, you're gradually building up a collection. So um, these cards I found were a little bit like um, a kind of card version of Mahjong. A Mahjong is a bit like you collect runs of things or collect all the dragons or the winds. Um, so uh, the they're, they're, again, that kind of quality of difference. So, um, uh, so I do think that the, the games do reflect um, perhaps um, a difference in in the way that people like to play the games. A lot of the most famous games, the ones that you've been mentioning, snakes and ladders, chess, backgammon, are kind of quite ancient games. Do you think all the best games are the ancient games because they've kind of been stress tested over time, over up well, here, or are there some good new ones? I mean, are there are there what was the yeah. kind of some fun new game that maybe you discovered that's, that's not that old. Um, yeah, I think we're in a renaissance actually for new games, which are um, really kind of uh, bringing, I guess, kind of new genres of games. So, you know, at one stage I began to think, oh, maybe there are only seven games, you know, like seven stories, um, racing games or capturing games, war games. Um, but actually, it's interesting because war games, um, which there are many, uh, from the Roman war games through to chess, through to risk, for example, um, uh, which I give some mathematical um, uh, tips for how to play risk if anyone likes risk. Um, but uh, after the Second World War, Germany 
uh, put a, kind of put a ban on on war games, uh, pu publishing war games. Uh, you know, uh, Panzer Division was not something that was going to go down very well. So, um, and actually. Germany always had quite a tradition of games. In Nuremberg, there's the games convention. Nuremberg toys have been made right back to medieval time. Um, so some Germans had the idea, uh, why don't we create a prize for the invention of new games? Um, so we now have this prize. And we've had the Nobel Prizes last week and today the Economics Prize. Um, the Nobel Prize of Games is called the Spiel des Jahres, the, the game of the year. And this actually inspired a lot of uh, new sort of games that have emerged um, from Germany and from, from Europe in particular. I mean, uh, so, some of the audience out there might know the Settlers of Catan. Um, that's one of my uh, family's favorite games. Um, uh, this one won the Spiel des Jahres, um, invented by a German dentist, actually. Um, uh, and um, this is about uh, settling a territory. So it's a trading game. So you talk a lot with your fellow participants. Uh, I think that's quite an important in a game because sometimes you sit there for ages whilst the other people make their moves um, and you're kind of a bit bored and there's no conversation. Yeah. This one is about training things all the way through the game. I, I mean, I'll tell you actually the reason I love this game so much is the board is made out of hexagons. Um, so, you know, it's not squares, uh, it's it's all hexagons. And um, actually my family know that a way to distract me in playing a game is um, if there's a kind of obscure bit of maths that is not related to the gameplay. So again, I was like intrigued, how many different ways are there to build up the Catan board? And, um, uh, and which has nothing to do with the game, and um, but it distracts them enough. So I think, yeah, a lot of really good games. A real new innovation in game playing came out of Spiel des Jahres, um, which was the idea of a collaborative game. So a game like Pandemic, um, where actually you all work together and you're sort of playing against the game, um, I think is a, you know, it's a really new idea because games in the past were all about competition against people. And the, actually the person who came up with um, Pandemic um, loved playing games with his wife, but his wife got so exasperated with his aggressive um, kind of psychological uh, uh, kind of way of playing that um, this guy decided, I have to come up with a game where we're working together. And so he came up with a um, story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Story. So you as a mathematician playing a game, do you have a style yourself? Do you feel this kind of extra pressure that the mathematician playing the mathematical game, you have to win or be some kind of judgment of you, not as a person, but as a mathematician? Um, do you always, is, is it always good to be quite aggressive in these games or how, yes. what, what's your style? Well, one of the problems is that, um, people have stopped playing games with me um, because uh, they just like, oh my God, he's going to have some clever trick. I'm not going to have any chance. So, you know, my family are like, uh, oh, so that's why I actually quite like collaborative games. Although I have to be careful in a collaborative game, you need to make sure just one person isn't, isn't driving everything. You do that, you do that. Yeah. So I have to be careful with those as well. But um, um, so you know, I think it varies from game to game. I mean, I think that's why I like playing backgammon with my kids because they know they've got a chance um, to beat me, even though, you know, I might know about um, creating blocks to stop people using the throws of the dice and things like that. Um, and I think each game is different. So for example, something like Risk, um, there was a lot of debate about whether being defensive or being aggressive in that game. I mean, it's basically a territory game where you take over the world. And the mathematical analysis originally was that it's better, actually, you got an advantage when you're defending a country. But it turned out that the person who did the analysis had made a mistake because the way you play the game is you the attacker has, in general, three dice, and the defender two dice. And it's actually quite interesting because you've got to compare the dice and there isn't an independency of the dice because sometimes one dice might be compared up against a, the, the large or the smaller of the defender's dice. And when this was taken into account, the probability is shifted. So it turns out the attacker has the advantage in that game. So in risk, 
I now know that it's better not to sit back and just let people uh, come at you, but actually to be aggressive and to be attacking more because you'll you'll have the ed edge as an attacker. So, so I think it really varies on the game. But as I say, nobody plays me anymore. So. <laughs> um, but they will now. Um, <laughs> there is a kind of maths of games, um, isn't there? And um, John Conway, British Great British Mathematician, was well, you know, wrote the classic book, I think, on the kind of maths yeah. game. And also, John Conway comes from an area of math similar to, to your area. I don't know if, if you had any experience with him or any the maths of games and, and some of his work links to any of yours. Yes. Um, uh, actually, when I was trying to decide where to do my PhD, um, I went up to Cambridge um, to talk to John Conway's group because um, I, I realized I wanted to study symmetry and um, they were the kind of leading group in symmetry. Um, and uh, it's interesting, when I went up, uh, all the students were playing on go boards in the in the common room. Um, but when I started to look, they weren't playing go. They were actually playing a game that John Conway had invented called the Game of Life. It's one of the uh, video games that I talk about in the book. Um, and this is actually quite useful to play with stones on uh, a go board. Um, but basically, there's a kind of very simple rules for um, whether a stone survives to the next generation, is born in a square or dies. Um, if it's uh, surrounded by too many things, it dies because there's too much competition. Um, too little, there are not enough resources, so it also dies. Um, just enough, and you will give birth to a new stone. Um, again, just some such simple rules. Um, yet mm. uh, John Conway uh, demonstrated that you just have incredible complexity. And so, actually, what the game that people were playing in the common room when I went up um, was exploring uh, some of the challenges that John had. Uh, offered them in like uh, can can a, a finite little area of stones um, expand infinitely across the universe of this game um, and that was turned out to be true you, you can create something a little like a little glider which kind of uh, every 15 generations shoots off this little glider and so gradually this thing is like uh, making little bits of life which uh, go across the board um, and it was proved that this game, although it's so simple to state, is so complex that you can actually embed something called a Turing machine inside the game. And a Turing machine is kind of like a universal computer that can be programmed to do anything any computer can be can do. So weirdly, in this game, it's possible to program, for example, um, the, the implications of the game can be that um, it can find all the prime numbers from you know here to infinity if you let the game run. That can be programmed into uh, laying out the stones in a particular way. It's so, kind of perfect intersection of academic math research and fun, playful gameplay. Yeah. I think it is. So we've been speaking for exactly 45 minutes. And for the last 15 minutes, there have been lots of... um. Questions coming through, and that someone I think has repeated a few times. Alison wants to please, please, please talk about Ticket to Ride. Is Ticket to Ride? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm so <laughs> glad. Talk yeah, about Tick strategies of Ticket to Ride. Oh my gosh, yes. I don't think I've Ticket played to that Ride. Game. I think is uh, a beautiful game. Partly, it 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 hits all of these sweet spots for me. Um, you explain it a bit, because I'm not sure. I'm yeah. Going to it. Oh yeah, no, it's it's yeah. great. So basically. It's basically, it's actually based on the Phileas Fogg story because when uh, Fogg is going across America, he goes by train. Um, and so the idea is that a few generations later, um, people are building train tracks across America. And so basically the game is that you've got to um, uh, like build tracks. You, you get challenges, um, ticket, these are the tickets to ride. The tickets say you've got to build a track from New York to Los Angeles, for example, or New Orleans up to, um, uh, I can't remember where the one to New Orleans goes, um, uh, Vancouver or something. Um, and so uh, basically you score points. And this is very interesting because making a game, um, devising the point score is such that you get the kind of sweet spot between um, uh, the game rewarding people who are taking risk, for example. Um, and this actually turns out to be um, the hint I will give you, because um, although the point score um, actually 
it's clear from if you look at it, the point score is um, uh, kind of incentivizing people doing longer tracks. But I did an analysis of this and really you wanted to choose the tickets which have as long as possible. Although um, that actually is risky because, you know, a short track you can satisfy quite quickly and then you get another ticket um, to play that. So you feel like, oh, my gosh, I don't want the one from New York to Los Angeles. But it turns out as well, there are tickets which have a lot of overlap as well um, if you take long tracks. So you can actually find yourself building a track and actually satisfying two tickets at the same time. So um, my little hint to you is to go for um, what looks like a risky option, but go for the long um, tracks in that game. So, um, but yeah, a beautiful game. I'm glad people brought that one up. Okay. And so I, I, there's, it's so simple that my, my family got it within the two minutes that I had to explain it to them. A good game. So Chelsea asks, what are your views on role-playing tabletop games like Dungeons and Dragons, where you can create whole worlds, stories, and games based on the same mechanism for every game? And it's certainly seeing an uptick in popularity. What's yeah, that? yeah. Dungeons and Dragons is one of the games in the book. Um, and actually I put it um uh, the the game the book's divided up into yeah visiting different continents but i take the sea journeys um say from the middle east to india to talk about more like um game themes like the philosophy of games or um uh yeah game theory in economics um but uh, i put dungeons and dragons in the psychology of games because i think there's a lot of evidence that dungeons and dragons um it really allowed a lot of people who are quite introverted a kind of safe space to actually open up and like play a character. There were safe rules um, that you you knew kind of a little bit what this world was like. It wasn't like the kind of scary world we live in where um, sort of strange things can happen. So, you know, obviously it was made famous uh, recently by Stranger Things, which, you know, the, the kids love playing um, Dungeons and Dragons. And um, in a way, I think it is a game that the nerds kind of found a way to to open up. And I certainly, you know, I played a bit of Dungeons and Dragons when I was a teenager. Um, uh, but it, again, it's that's a nice example in a way of a collaborative game because you work together as a team. Um, it's also a good example of something I talk about in the book, which is called non-transitive games. Um, so, um, you know, rock, paper, scissors um, is probably the classic example because there's no one thing which uh, dominates all, all the rest. You know, paper is good against stone, um, but stone is good against scissors and, and the scissors is good against paper. And I think what Dungeons and Dragons is something really nice about it because um, no one player um, is going to be the lead in it. Each time the game develops, um, it'll be the dwarf that's important or, or the, the the wizard. Um, so there's a nice element of that kind of simplicity of non-transitivity, which means there's no thing which dominates any other, um, which is a nice quality, I think, in Dungeons and Dragons. So um, I also pay that that thing you said before that when it's nice to have randomness, but not kind of too much. You want to sort of use the randomness to seed something interesting rather yeah. than being it just all random like snakes and ladders and it just gets a bit boring because like it's no yeah issue. um uh my my dungeons and dragons board which i have uh box i i was kind of um when, when i got this game uh my my room is such a mess that i can't see it but um uh when i got this game i was slightly disappointed when i opened the box because I was expecting, you know, like, like loads of fantastic pieces like dungeon, like dragons and, you know, an amazing board. And basically there are five dice and a very big, big instruction manual, um, which I was tasked as in my family with being dungeon master. And it felt like kind of sitting an exam. I spent a week preparing this dungeon for, for my family. Um, uh, but I do like it because, it, you know, it's just got such... A variety of dice you know not just cube shaped dice but 20 sided dice and so that certainly appealed to the mathematician in me um i don't play backgammon so i don't really understand this question but oh, yeah if you do so i'm sure you will um someone wants to know what your move would be if on the first throw you throw a six and a three what would you do oh my gosh um uh i'm i i i I'm not sure what I would do I because I, I'd need to visualize the board and I'm not very good at that. Um, so uh, actually a six and a five is the best 
kind of opening that you want. And in fact, um, I learned this game when I was in Sinai, uh, uh, when I was a postdoc in Israel, in Jerusalem. And they call the game Sheshbesh, which is um, uh, Shesh is Hebrew for six and Besh is Turkish for five. And so if you got six and five when you rolled it to begin with, you would shout Shesh Besh um, excitedly. Um, so I'm afraid I, I don't have, I'd have to uh, maybe come back to that person a little later to, to plan my best move. Or maybe <laughs> some other people in the in the uh, the chat can o- offer a, a good move for six and five. Um, do you have a favorite video game? Yes, I do. Um, I have to be very careful with video games because I can, I, I, I'm very, I have a very addictive personality. So video games, I, I can just descend into like and people don't see me. So the one that really, uh, it was actually when I was in Jerusalem, uh, I, I got obsessed with Prince of Persia and Prince of Persia this is a cute little um, prince who darts about the 2D um, um, screen. And um, actually, I started playing this with a secretary in the department. She'd been in the Israeli army um, and uh, she was really good at the fighting. And I was really good at all the puzzle solving. Um, but I played that game so much that I would dream about this little character. And so I've had to be very careful ever because I wasted so many <laughs> weeks playing that game and you know the professor i was working with likes you know have you got no further with the theorem that you're trying to browse oh no but i have got to level 12 i mean so um i mean uh you know uh, zelda has to be another of my favorites and that i have to be very careful with because you know zelda is rather beautiful because often a video game will suffer because somebody's kind of forcing you into a particular way of playing because uh, of the way the, the the game is built and zelda has just a freedom to roam you know there's still a narrative that you've got to go through and and levels but but i i love the freedom that zelda has to just feel like you're exploring a world so i think um but that again i have to be very very careful with what would be the ultimate game for a rubik's cube fanatic do you think yeah, that's a good one. Um, Apart from a Rubik's Cube, I guess. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. The other um, sliding block ones. Well, Rubik's Cube, you see, um, has more of a puzzle element to it. So, so it didn't get in the book because I, mm. I don't count it's it true. as a game. Puzzle, yeah. You know, uh, that was, I mean, it's, it's interesting that I did put in Wordle. And Wordle, I put in because you were sharing your scores. So it became a game once you were kind of, I mean, I, my mother and I just exchange our Wordle um, scores each morning and, just, and it became a game because we're now competing against each other. Um, so it's interesting, but I mean, for me, uh, a Rubik's cube has so much beautiful mathematics behind it, mathematics related to the mathematics of symmetry. So I would suggest the person actually play the game, which I play, as a research mathematician, which is the game of group theory, which is um, the the game exploring the consequences of symmetry. So, so come and join me in the mathematics department in Oxford. <laughs> and let us play together, um, kind of exploring the implications of the rules of of group theory, which the Rubik's cube is, is part of that. It's just a Rubik's cube is is a kind of is, is a puzzle. Like it's just you doing it um, with the computer games. It can be with other people, it's just you. Do you think that a game really needs to have some kind of interaction? I do. And, and yeah. that's why I, you know, I sort of put video games in because my wife said, you you won't sell any books to the kids <laughs> if you don't have videos in. <laughs> so, oh my God, you're, you're doing boring games like Backgammon. So I, I, I took a little bit of advice from my wife to, to put it. <laughs> but actually, um, you know. Sounds like you've got some good personal history with computer games. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I do think, um, you know, I, I did have that desire to make Prince of Persia a, a collaborative game that you know, I wanted to play with somebody else. I and mean, we sort of took it in turns. But of course, there are. I mean, my mum is an obsessive gamer and, and she plays, you know, um, things like Dark Summoner and uh, Villages and Heroes. And that is about playing massively online with, um, you know, you, you form a tribe and you work together. So I think, you know, the video game does allow for. Um, but very often, yeah, I mean, I actually went down to the Serpentine Gallery. They've got an exhibition in the, the North Serpentine at the moment which is 
basically just sitting and playing a video game through this kind of rather mm. beautiful world. Um, it's great because having written a book about games, I can now justify spending two hours um, playing <laughs> games. Um, so, uh, but I did feel at the end, oh, I was just playing on my own, you know, in this world, it was kind of fun, but but it didn't satisfy that. You know, one of the other reasons we think that people play games together is to bind a community and also to kind of almost like um, you have to have a theory of mind to play a game because you have to think about what how your, your opponent's going to play next. And so perhaps games... And this is one of the suggestions in the books. Games developed when our consciousness beginning began to emerge because we needed to imagine what it was like to be somebody else. And we needed to kind of have a way of um, demonstrating our agency, our character. Um, so that's sort of slightly missing in a video game when you're playing on your own. So for me, games are about community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Someone asks, have you tried Mysterium? I imagine that's a game. <laughs> um I mean, the wonderful thing about this book is that I think I could probably do around the world in 160 games and then 240 games because, you know, uh, there are so many games that are bubbling up. Um, so, so this is not a game I, I, I know. And, and thank you, because I always <laughs> love finding out about new games. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, the, the lovely... And but it's quite interesting how often you know as I said there are only seven stories there are quite often only seven games and and when you start to explore a game you go oh that's interesting because that's similar to this other game that I know so I, I will go and explore Mysterium and see um, uh, whether it's recognizable or maybe it's a new sort of game that I can uh, add to my list. So we've got two minutes left. Um, there were two questions, the first two questions, actually, that I'd missed because I hadn't scrolled up. So the first one, so maybe we should finish with these two. One yeah. is, uh, my wife dislikes playing board games with me because I try to optimise my chances of winning by using maths and stats. So my question is, should I do this less or should I find someone else to play with? <laughs> no, well, I think, you know, perhaps we've answered that because I think pandemic was created by somebody exactly in your position. Um, so I would try some collaborative games. I mean, there are um, some lovely games where you, you all work together, uh, puzzle solving games, um, which are, I mean, I'm gonna do a little plugging for a company that I don't have any um, uh, shares <laughs> in this, but we love playing this game as a, a family, um, games like this, because uh, you're basically trying to solve puzzles and, and uh, work your way through through the game. Mm. Um, so I, I think those collaborative games are mean that you can play safely some strategy, but play together. Yeah. So the quote, so the answer is, don't do it less, just play a different game. Yeah. <laughs> the final question, then, is a nice way to, to, to do the last question. Um, do you think games are a good way of teaching young people about math? I'm sure the answer is going to be yes, but maybe you could suggest some games which would be the best ones to, that you think are the most kind of didactic games for education. Yeah, I think, um, you, you know, one has to be careful with this because, as I said, games uh, should be useless and purposeless and not. Uh, um, however, I do think that they're because of my thesis that games are a way of playing mathematics, that I do think that um, playing games with, with kids is a, fan, a fantastic way to explore the underlying math. So uh, anything with two dice, I think, is really exciting uh, way. So even uh, something like Monopoly or, or playing snakes and ladders with two dice, for example, um, I think. Uh, uh, spotting patterns that's often so I think that um, there's a wonderful game called set which I talk about um, which are um, you yeah. know is Basically, uh, you lay out loads of cards and you have to spot, um, you, you know, three cards which have either different, all different color or all different number or all different shape or the same. Um, and I think that encourages um, uh, that pattern searching mind, which is what mm. I think a mathematician is. So, um, yeah, but any game, I think, will have a, a wonderful bit of maths and will, will, will help you to to become a mathematician, hopefully. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Marcus. We're one minute over. Um, thank you very much, um, everyone, for coming. And it's been a fantastic conversation. I've really oh, Thank you, it. Alex. Yeah. Thank you. Five by 15 yeah. as well. Yes. Thanks. Five by 15. Alex, thank you so much. That was so much fun. I just want to go away and play a game now. I think I've <laughs> got a new knowledge in hand. So it can. 
And buy the book. There it is. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, Mark is going to be promoting the book. <laughs> oh, yes. Go so from you and Bookshop. You can find details about that in the chat. Uh, and yeah, thank you all for attending this evening and for playing along. Um, please do keep your eyes peeled for 5x15's future events. We have our first event in a new series with Rathbones and Kew Gardens next week on nature's diversity with Jonathan Drury, Luke Turner and Brigitte Baptiste. So do tune in for that. That's on Tuesday, October 17th. Marcus, Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Good night. Oh, our pleasure. Good Thank night. you.